Hi everyone, it's Quickie Baby and welcome back to World of Tanks and today I'm going to be rating every single tier 10 vehicle in the game so you can get an idea of what I would recommend you to focus on in 2024. It takes a lot of experience and a lot of time to go up the tech trees so I'm really hoping that today's video will help you save some time in the new year. So right off the bat let's go through the heavies. So the 113. This vehicle, pff, I would, I, it's yo-yoing between the alright situation and avoid section for me. This tank just hasn't really been given the love that a lot of other heavy tanks are receiving in the game and by far the most frustrating aspect of this vehicle for me is the lack of seven degrees of gun depression over the front of the vehicle. I really enjoy the 5A. It's so much more flexible with regards to that and I don't have to overexpose my side when I'm trying to work a ridgeline. Combine this with the fact that there are just so many heavy tanks that going into the game that do what this vehicle does and I think you'd be a little bit mad to want to, want to purchase this vehicle apart from in one use case and that is that if you spend the six million credits required to get this tank you can actually get the gun unlocked for the wz120 for free so when you go on that tank you won't have to waste 50,000 free experience or grind with a horrible gun so one use case for the 113 i'm gonna put it personally for me in the avoid section Next up, the WZ-1115A. I personally really like this tank, although results may vary. This is a high damage per minute vehicle, and if you aren't willing to be aggressive with it to take your chances and to push your opponents, then quite often timid play in this vehicle results in it kind of getting out-traded by tanks that maybe have higher alpha damage guns or just don't have big weak points. But this wonderful combination of speed with offensive capabilities mean, at least for me, it's going between the great performer and the decent choices section. I'm probably going to put it in the great performer personally for me. Just love that gun depression over the front compared to the 113. Next up, the BZ-75. This vehicle is currently supporting the best win ratio of any of the tier 10 heavy tanks. However, when you take a look at how good the players who are playing this vehicle are, the best players are playing this tank. It's quite meta in the game right now. Accordingly, I don't really feel like it deserves the title of godlike. I'm going to put it in the super competitive section still, however, if you are a good player. But if you are not, I would probably recommend avoiding this vehicle because you just won't know where to go and invest those rockets in getting there to be able to make use of dominating the strongest positions in the game and that is what you have to do with the bz75 you have to be aggressive you have to take it to the enemy team and you really also have to use really good equipment on this vehicle as it scales very well with things like the uh, experimental mobility all in all this is the, the one of the new heavies and one of the new tanks of this list and i think for it to go into the super competitive section is is fair Next up, VZ-55. While wow, last year I'd expect this thing would have been godlike, however, with the nerfs to the auto-loading gun, it's not there anymore. For me, I'm still going to put it in the great performer section because any tank that can deal 980 damage within 2.5 seconds still has a great role on the battlefield. It's just not the same that it previously was when it reloaded faster with better aim time and better intra-clip reload. I think Wargaming did a great job with nerfing this vehicle. It's still an enjoyable tank to play, but it is just not the, the overpowered vehicle that it was last year. Next, let's talk about a controversial vehicle. This is the AMX 50B. I absolutely hate this tank, but I still have to respect what it's able to do on the battlefield. This is not the tank for somebody who wants to engage and be an active player. This is the kind of tank for somebody who wants to wait for an ally to engage, swoop in, dump out that magazine, play that classic auto reload a roll, and more often than not, kind of engage at decent distances. The vehicle's win ratio is not bad, but one thing that this tank does have uh, the displeasure of having is by far the worst win rate difference of any of the tier 10 heavies. There's a lot of very good players playing the 50B, but they aren't having very good results, at least with regards to win ratio, but they are picking up a lot of damage playing this tank. But this tank has by far the worst turret armor of any of the heavy tanks, and that for me, is what ruins this vehicle. Next, the AMX M454. This vehicle last year was up in the godlike section. However, it has received two nerfs since then. And in my opinion, good job to Wargaming. I'd say now it's it's kind of between the super competitive and the great performer section. I'd probably put it in great performer. It's still a solid tank. You now have to choose which gun you want to use. For me personally, that's going to be the 120 millimeter. That's what gave me my third mark on this vehicle this year. And all in all, you really can't go wrong with this vehicle as long as you can keep your opponents in front of you and hide those two weak points on top. It is just a solid tank and it's very easy to play as well. So it's friendly for all manner of players inside World of Tanks. 
Next, the Panzer 7. Okay, at the start of this year, I put the Panzer 7 in the I hate it section because I just had a massive skill issue. I always thought, wow, I side scrape and the weak point is awful. And then I realized that if you actually use the lower plate well on this tank and you kind of just grit your teeth and bear to the mantlet weaknesses that this vehicle has, it's actually pretty darn good. This vehicle is right in the middle of the pack, but if you can master this vehicle, then it is going to go way, way up in a lot of people's expectations. This is maybe a hot take, but Wargaming is scheduled to buff this vehicle this year. And I can tell you, if they do, I think it is going to become an overpowered vehicle in the game because right now, not the best players are playing it, but a lot of players are still having very good results with this tank. I'm personally packing 64, 65% win rate solo in this vehicle. If they buff it, it might be uh, the first completely overpowered German tank that we've had in the longest of times, probably since the mouse were, was pre-nerfed. Talking about the mouse, here it is. I absolutely love this vehicle. I, I'm not going to put it up in the super competitive section. For me, it's still going to be a great performer, but for sheer joy and fun, it's got to go into the godlight section, right? The mouse has the highest hit points in the game. Get yourself a bond durability device on it and your tracks will become almost immortal then get yourself a decent turbo as good as you can get on this vehicle and you're going to be fast enough to really make the push plays. There is no more fun vehicle in the game if you're a great player who knows how to angle your armor effectively. And that kind of mastery in the mouse, once you get there, it's going to take some practice. There's almost nothing else in the game that feels as good as the mouse when it's going. Next up, let's talk about the E100. The E100 for me, I, I wouldn't put it in the great performer section. When it's 128 millimeter got buffed, it definitely helped the vehicle out. But for me, I'm gonna put it in the decent choices section. You can't go really wrong for the E100. And while it does pain me that my first tier 10 that I ever got in World of Tanks is not higher up on this list, I think this is, this is fair. The lower plate is just awkward. That turret armor falls to very high penetration, high, ex uh, high explosive anti-tank rounds or gold rounds. And for that purpose, I just find myself more interested in playing other heavy tanks. The mouse is more fun. And I'd even argue probably the Panzer 7 is more competitive when you start to get good in the Panzer 7 with its higher alpha damage and its great shell velocity on both of its rounds. Now, one thing I'd like to highlight about the E100 is that the 150 millimeter caliber gun on this vehicle just play a 60 TP instead. It's better in almost every way. And with the 128, there's so many other tanks that kind of have the same vibe as the E100. It just doesn't really feel like that, that super heavy special tank that it possibly could be. Now let's talk about the Kampfpanzer. Again, this one's yo-yoing between the Great Performer Decent Choices section for me. This was uh, the Assembly Shop Rewards. There's, still, there's no opportunity to be able to get this tank in the game anymore. For me, I, I think it has to go into the same place as the 5A because that's what it is. It really is just a 5A that arguably has a little bit less weak points, but I'd say the 5A with its better heat pen and higher alpha damage just feels like it's that more aggressive tank. So the, the Kampfpanzer is very solid. It's definitely better armored than the 5A will be, but quite a lot of players will actually do way better in the 5A once you take the fight to the enemy team and use that tank's stonking firepower. Next up, let's talk about the Rhinoceronte. For a lot of people, they're going to put it in the avoid or all right situational section. For me, I'm going to put it in a decent choice, but again, only if you can master the auto reloader on this vehicle. And I, I stress that, that... If you are a very good player, you will be do, able to do some very surprising things with the Rhinoceronte. And one of the tank's biggest strengths is that a lot of people don't quite know how it works. And they don't realize it can do 1,470 damage within eight seconds of the first shot. Although after that, it's going to have to be reloading for pretty much a minute. So you should only do that when the situation absolutely dictates it. And that's the biggest issue that a lot of people will have with the Rhinoceronte is not quite knowing when to be able to fire but that's something that only just comes with experience after playing auto reloaders for a very long time you're probably going to have to do that before you start to get good in the rhinoceronte let me clarify this is a high skill cap tank probably one of the highest skill cap tanks in the game if you're an incredibly good player it's probably going to go up around here if you're not then it's going to go down towards this area next up type 5 heavy the crazy thing about this vehicle is if you are an average or significantly below average player, this is a good tank. But if you're a great player, you're probably going to end up being frustrated by this vehicle. For me, 
I'm, I'm going to put it in the all right situational section, almost in the avoid section. However, um, its armor just doesn't hold up in tier 10 matchups and getting into those tier 9 and tier 8 games just feels oh so hard to do these days. There are better super heavies for you to play in the game like the mouse and the type 5 heavy. Next up, 60 TP. I think this vehicle is absolutely incredible. I hardly ever if if never have a bad game in the 60 tp this vehicle is just so consistent eight degrees of gun depression decent hull armor decent turret armor 750 alpha damage enough penetration on all of its different rounds to adapt to the scenario i absolutely love this tank it was the first ever vehicle that i did 10,000 damage in and it's really interesting to see that it's actually coming back into the meta right now as players realize just how strong the vehicle's capabilities are the 152 millimeter on this vehicle can overmatch quite a lot of plates that not a lot of people realize. Like, for example, the, the forehead of the 60TP, uh, as well as also the Super Conqueror on the top of the Super Conqueror as well. And for that, if you know, if you have a great knowledge of enemies' armor capabilities and the layout, this vehicle can really surprise with what it can do with the different guns. And this one, it's also a very friendly vehicle to play. All sorts of players can play this. Awful players can play this. Incredible players can play this. It is definitely one of my top picks that I would recommend going for in 2024. Next up, the Kranvang. I feel sad for the Kranvang because this vehicle has gone from godlike with the nerfs all the way down to probably the all right situation or decent choices section. For a lot of people who aren't going to have the experience in the Kranvang and won't know all of the different positions to make the 12 degrees of gun depression work, it's probably going to go into the avoid. For me, I'm still going to put it in a decent choices, but let me clarify, this is just for me and my list, and for a lot of people it's going to go into the alright situation and avoid, because people just can't seem to make the tanks relatively low damage per minute work, the mediocre gun handling, and the horrible hull armor. However, if you know where to take the Kranvang and you get it on a ridge line, it is still a decent choice in every single regard and you will do well in this vehicle. But it's got a lot of competition now. The VZ-55, Renocheronte and AMX 50B will all be better tanks for different kinds of players. If you know your positions, if you know your ridge lines, the Kranvang will still work for you. Next up, FV215B. I'm going to put this in the I hate it section. Um, it was the first ever tier 10 British heavy tank, replaced by the Super Conqueror, which is infinitely better in so many ways. I hate the side weak point on this vehicle. I hate the fact that it, it burns constantly. And it's just so frustrating because this tank actually has the highest damage per minute of any heavy tank in the game. But it's still trash because you don't get to use that effective damage per minute on this vehicle. All in all, don't waste your bonds on this vehicle. It is by far one of the biggest stinkers and its current average win rate is actually below 45%. It is truly tragic. Don't bother with the FV215B. Spend your bonds on something else. Go get a Super Conqueror and put bond equipment on it instead and you will be infinitely better. So the Super Conqueror. Um, this tank is yo-yoing between the Super Competitive and the Godlike section. Uh, for me, I think it's the first heavy tank on this list that's going to go up into Godlike scenario and that is because it just does well for everyone everybody's win ratio is decent when they play this vehicle and it's very very competitive in all manner of places unlike the fv215b this thing can side scrape it also has uh, more gun depression and spaced armor that can allow the vehicle to actually work a ridge line recent i recently three marked the the super conqueror and the play session was was disgusting I would recommend gun armor, vents, and turbo, and a, a durability, and then mix those up depending on what your play style is for the for the map. For me, actually, I found that the turbo, vents, and gun armor full kind of like aggression build just allowed me to get to ridge lines and just dominate when I was there. This thing is an absolute monster of the battlefield, and I would thoroughly recommend the British heavy line for everyone. Uh, at least we'll have to see what Wargaming are going to do about this one because if I think if anything is up for the chopping block with regards to buffs or nerfs, well, in this case, nerfs, it's definitely going to be the Super Conqueror, which would be ironic considering that Wargaming just buffed all of the British heavies. So I'd, I'd get it while it's hot, boys and girls. Next up, let's talk about the Chieftain. This vehicle has been nerfed, but even with the nerf, it is still an incredible vehicle. It's faster than the Super Conqueror and it arguably has a better turret than the Super Conqueror as well. And that is all you need. The problem with the Chieftain is that now it doesn't even come close to having the firepower of the Super Conqueror, but it does have better alpha damage, which does allow you to make those trades in certain scenarios. 
With its gold rounds being nerfed as well, this tank, it's close to dropping down into the super competitive section, but for me, it's still godlike. But hats off to Wargaming for the nerf to the Chieftain this year, as they've totally reduced the number of them in the matchmaker, because truly, before it was completely overpowered. Whereas now, there's other opportunities, like playing the Super Conqueror instead of the Chieftain. And I think that's a better state than when previously all of the Clan Wars players just have their overpowered vehicles to play. Next up, let's talk about the M5Y. I'm going to put this thing in the alright situational section, because when you do get on a ridgeline, this tank is very good. The problem is, is that there are so many other tanks that do just as well, if not better, on a ridgeline. I'm looking at you, Super Conqueror. I'm looking at you, Chieftain. Even the Rhinocerante, the Cranvang, there are so many tanks which compete with this vehicle. And the problem with the M5Y is that the reserve track mechanic that Wargaming put in for this vehicle just doesn't really have the impact that I expect that they thought it was going to have. It doesn't seem to really make too much of a difference on the tank. And then you'll find that one of the longest, thinnest turrets in the game becomes incredibly frustrating whenever you expose it towards the side. Next up, let's talk about the T-57 Heavy, and that's going to be joining the M5Y in the all right situational section. It, it can be a lot of fun to play when you just get an opportunity to blitz and reload and blitz and reload, dump out that 1,600 damage in six seconds and reload quickly to be able to do it all again. The T-57 Heavy thrives in chaos and it has a lot of hit points to weather the storm to be able to deliver those mags. But with the limited amount of ammunition that this vehicle carries, it quite often just feels frustrating towards the latter part of the battle. And the fact that the turret armor is pretty tragic unless you're playing against tier 8 and tier 9 tanks. I just feel like there are more dependable heavy tanks to play out there. And the fact that this one has an autoloader doesn't really outweigh the fact that it is so much worse in so many scenarios than other heavies. Next up, let's talk about the T-110E5. And this thing, it's, it's kind of between super competitive and great performer. This thing is solid. And if you manage to get onto a corner where you side scrape and you get to avoid your weak point being targeted, this has to be one of the best tanks in the game. Combine that with great heat pen of 340, very nice damage per minute. This thing is an absolute beast. Just watch out for that weak point getting hit. And if you manage to do that and just don't care and be aggressive and get that gun singing, then you're going to do well in this vehicle. Next up, let's talk about the Object 260. This thing, it's still super competitive. Uh, I think that definitely time is moving on with regards to World of Tanks, but the 260 got a very nice buff when Wargaming introduced the field mods and equipment 2.0. This thing has a lot of opportunities to use funky equipment like the turbo, maybe even the experimental turbo, and the field mods to improve its top speed by an additional four kilometers an hour that allow it to kind of now contest areas that maybe some even medium tanks can't. And when you get there and you ram your opponents out the way and you destroy them in single combat, well, hopefully single combat, this thing's still a powerhouse. I don't really enjoy its playstyle all that much. Personally, for me, the IS-7 kind of does the same thing, but I think that the 260, for the majority of players, will still do it better than the IS-7 will. Next up, the Object 705A. And this thing is is switching between Great Performer and Decent Choice for me. Ha! I, I definitely didn't understand how this thing worked until this year, but now, having practiced the vehicle and knowing about its full side-scraping capacity and just living in a position... I'm gonna. I'm probably gonna have to put it in the great performer section. I think this thing is solid. I think it can side scrape like an absolute boss. Nobody can really deal with it when it does. And the only problem that the tank has is it has horrible accuracy, pretty mediocre gun handling, not the best of heat pen. And I think that you'd still be a little bit crazy to want to play this, which is just focused for that one situation side scraping scenario, than playing something like a 60 TP, which has better gun depression, better alpha damage, and just all round better performance at least in my opinion next up the object 277 i personally feel that this thing is close to the the 5a but i think it's just a little bit worse i think that the extra one and a half degrees of gun depression that the 5a gets mean that it's just a little bit more flexible and for me the aggression that i can get in the 5a with the higher damage per minute just outclasses the 277 however let me clarify for average players and below average players, you will probably end up doing better in this tank than you will do in the 5A because the armor, at least on the upper hull, feels a little bit more reliable. The side scraping is a lot better on the 277 than the 5A and the gun capacity doesn't really matter so much when you need that extra durability. So for average and below players, 277. For average and above players, 
5A will be better, at least in, in my opinion. Next up, the Object 2798, straight into the Godlight section still. Wargaming have nerfed this, they did the right thing, they've made it so it's not just driving around the battlefield, farming absolutely everyone as quickly as, as, as possible. They've reduced the hit points of this vehicle, they've reduced the top speed limit a little bit, and they, they nerfed that accuracy on this tank, as well as the gold pen. So the 279E, it's not like it previously was, where it would just destroy the game, but it's still great, if not the best heavy tank uh, with regards to performance uh, in 2023, even with the nerf. Next up, let's talk about the ST2. Wargaming buffing this thing now means that it's between the super competitive and great performer section. For me, I'm going to put it in super competitive, but for a lot of players, it'll probably be more like great performer or decent choice. I, I'm putting it in the super competitive section because I always just seem to get so many kills playing this vehicle. It's a great one for doing missions. My damage output's decent. The, the double barrel allows you to do 880 damage. Uh, and you can whittle down your opponents in single uh, shot mode until you get them to that magical point where you can come around the corner and double them to be able to shut them down. Wargaming's buffs of this vehicle to improve the... Uh, the, the barrel switching to four seconds as well as also improving the rotation speed on the turret now means that you can probably just use kind of vents durability turbo on this vehicle and get away without the rotation device or vert stabs and so it's just great news for the st2 it's a very competitive tank it's a very fun tank and i i would thoroughly recommend the st2 for all players but especially the average and the above average players who are going to know how to make use of its gun Next, the Object 780. This thing, great performer. It's just so well-rounded. Seven degrees of gun depression, 500, 530 alpha damage. Very, very accurate. Armor that just works, at least most of the time. The problem is, is when you start to play against knowledgeable players who know about the weak points of this vehicle, then it starts to fall back, and it just doesn't have the damage per minute quite often to get through its scenarios. However, for it's still a great tank, and if you ever manage to get your hands on this vehicle, well, I wouldn't recommend spending like 100 or $200 worth of currency to be able to get it. It's still a good tank to have. It's just a little too balanced in that regard to go higher up on this list. Next up, let's talk about the IS-7. This vehicle for me is still absolutely funky. I'm going to be putting it in the super competitive section. I get one of my best win ratios on any of my Soviet heavies playing this vehicle, and it's because I am not afraid to go forward. My favorite build on this vehicle will be a spool liner, bear with me, with uh, Krausers inside the mobility slot and then a turbo in the other slot, hopefully a bounty turbo. Next, what you do is take a large repair kit or a repair kit, depending on how your economy is, take speed governors and then a premium consumable or a medkit or a fire extinguisher for me it's uh repair speed governor and then a premium consumable what this will mean is that the spool liner allows you to drop the medkit which allows you to use that speed governor to get the 10 percent extra engine power to race into position ram something or just bully your opponent out of that position and that's all it really takes just get forwards and i just love the is7 for the aggression that it brings to the battlefield there is no more fun tank if you're a little bit mad but still don't get the is7 and think that oh it's going to be this amazing incredible super powerhouse unless you invest the time to set it up correctly also let me clarify if you do do that build without the med kit i would thoroughly recommend getting jack of all trades on your commander as well for when nightmare scenarios happen in your spore liner didn't protect you next let's talk about the is4 this might be a shock to a lot of you but i'm whacking this one in the super competitive section as well this is just a very strong and underrated tank if you side scrape it's amazing if you learn how to angle this thing's armor it's a lot like a mouse within that regard this thing is very underrated in the game. In the last 30 days, it's actually giving its owners the best win ratio difference of any of the tech tree heavy tanks. And the only thing I don't like about it is how little ammunition this tank can carry. If it could carry a little bit more, I'd feel like I had all that I needed for later on in the battle. But it's just, it's, it's almost like a sleeper OP tank, this one. And I would thoroughly recommend getting your hands on an IS-4. Okay, so that was all of the heavies. Now let's take a look at the mediums. Firstly, the 121. I'm going to be dropping the 121 in the great performers section. Why? 440 alpha damage, very good standard pen, very good heat pen, and it's now getting quite a lot faster to be able to actually contest positions. This vehicle is, since it's buff, 
buffs have also been underrated in the game, a lot like the IS-4. However, let me clarify that you do have to be willing to be quite an aggressive player in the one to one to take the fight to the enemy team, because if you're not using the vehicle strengths with regards to its firepower and you don't know about hiding your hull and ex only exposing your turret, you're probably going to end up struggling in this vehicle. I wouldn't recommend it for everyone, but it's definitely still a solid choice for all tankers if they think it's going to match their playstyle. Next up, the 121B. I'm going to be dropping the 121B in the decent choices section. Any vehicle that has like 420 meters view range, which frees up a lot of its field mods and its equipment choices to not have to use coated optics, to be able to take the extra speed, for example, it's just darn decent. It also has 350 heat pen, which is monstrous. I think the problem with this vehicle is that the 121 just feels as if it trades a little bit better with that higher alpha damage. And the main thing that annoys me on the 121B is the fact that its gun handling is so poor that I end up having to use vert stabs, which is not something that I want to do on a medium tank, as it truly feels like it has more tier 9 gun handling than tier 10. Next up, let's talk about the TVP. Now, if you're a very, very good player, this is probably in the great performer section. If you're not, probably more all right situational. For me, I'm going to leave it in the decent choices section to try and create a balance between those, those two spots. And that is because the TVP just has no armor and it's a very big tank with poor camo rating. So a lot of people don't have that crutch to be able to kind of like to lay on to be able to get them through the battle. However, if you can work around that, this thing dumps out damage. Four and a half seconds, deal 1,280. But again, a problem. Almost the worst standard pen and the worst premium pen on any of the tier 10 mediums mean that you are going to have to flank your opponents or use precision marksmanship to target the weaker areas of their vehicle. There are better autoloaders for players who lack knowledge to play. But for a lot of people, the, the magic of just going crazy in a TVP and using the full gun handling build just makes it feel like it's this laser gun that just absolutely shreds the battlefield. Next up, let's talk about the bat chat. This thing, it's going in the all right situational. Personally for me, until they buff it, I'd put it in the avoid section. The bat chat is still a great assassin. It can go everywhere and do anything, uh, hopefully against just one tank on the enemy team. That's because it just takes so long to be able to unload this. We're talking about 12 and a half seconds to be able to dump its entire magazine out. And that is uh, a lifetime in World of Tanks. That's more than enough time for pretty much any vehicle to shoot you a couple of times with big alpha or uh, like three times with, with smaller alpha. And that just means that you just have to lose so many hit points to actually get those magical damaging moments in the bat chat that kind of just strip it of its effect on the battlefield. I'm really interested to see what Wargaming will do with this vehicle. I hope they kind of make it a bit more like a char future four. If they do that, this will be uh, jumping up at least a, a couple of spaces, if not more, up the list. So stay tuned for 2024 to see what Wargaming do with the bat chat. Next up, AMX 30B. I'm putting this thing between the avoid or the I hate it section. Do I really care about this vehicle enough to put in the I hate it section? Uh, uh, you know what? I don't really care about this tank. So I'm just going to put it in the avoid because I, I feel like if I put the I hate it section, hate is close to love. It's close to passion, right? I really have just no feelings about this vehicle apart from to tell you to not waste just 6 million credits on it. It's got so many things to dislike about it. Although it has the highest damage per minute of any of the tier 10 mediums, uh, a lot like the FV215B below it, it just doesn't have the penetration, it doesn't have the shell velocity, and it has a big old weak point on top and a frustrating hull that just means that your, your camera rating as well from that weak point isn't great. There are far better tanks that you could be able to invest your time and hard-earned cash into. Next up, E50M. A vehicle that one time Uncle Scrubby Baby said was weak. However, since I equip it with a full ramming build and uh, I've been having a lot of fun in it to say the least, I'm going to put the E50M in the great performer section. It is a solid choice. And the great thing about the E50M is it will be good for all players. It won't be incredible for all players, but it will be good for the casual players uh, all the way up to the, the great players as well. And that's because it just has the armor to allow you to make mistakes on the battlefield. And its gun is just so consistent. You will consistently deal damage. And also, everybody knows how to ram, right? So once you've got all the field mods on this vehicle, you could set yourself up with a, a second funky build on it and just charge straight at your opponents. And quite often you'll be able to overpower them. I've rammed tanks for like 1,300 multiple times this year by playing the E50M, and it's it's still to this day one of my 
favorite tanks for going on blowing off some steam in the game. I love it and everyone should have it. Next up, it's Brother, the, the Leopard one. For me, I'm gonna put this in the decent choices section. However, let me clarify that the Leopard is doing quite a lot of damage inside the game. So if that's what you care about, you probably wanna put it up up this list. For me, however, the complete lack of armor that forces it to play towards the mid to the rear of the battlefield prevents it from being truly impactful in a large amount of its games. However, with the correct setup, this thing does become an incredibly terrifying sniper vehicle that can achieve quite a lot of camo to dictate that vision combat against its opponents. And if the Leopard can see its foes and they can't catch it, phew, there's hardly any better tanks in the game. Next up, the Progetto 65. I mean, there should be another section down here that says, like, Wargaming hates it. This was one of the most depressing things of 2023. The fact that Wargaming took a very balanced tank and just destroyed it because they had made it popular. I, I still can't forgive Wargaming for that. They nerfed the Progetto 65 not because it was overpowered. They nerfed it because it was too popular inside the game. And Wargaming were the people who made this tank popular. They featured it in a battle pass. They featured it at top of the tree at the same time. And then they're like, oh no, we've made it too popular. Now we nerf it. And now one of the best medium tanks is not getting particularly good win ratio results. However, let me clarify that its actual effect on players' win ratio is not half bad. And that is because a lot of the sweaty players are playing the next tank that's coming up on the list. Everyone who got the Lion will play the Lion instead of playing the Progetto. So a lot of the, the casual players and the new players are forced to play the Progetto to have that kind of auto-reloading vibe. So consequently, the Progetto is actually doing worse. Uh, well, it, it, it looks like it's doing worse than it actually is because all the sweaty people only play the Lion now, which means that the casual players are playing the Progetto and they are actually getting fairly good results for themselves. Accordingly, I'm still going to put the Progetto in the Decent Choices section. I still think it's a good tank for everyone inside the game. And the only reason why it's not doing better is because all of the, uh, the more experienced and skilled player base have moved on to playing the Lion. However, let me clarify that they aren't doing that much better in the Lion than they are in the Progetto. The Lion actually has the third worst win ratio difference of any medium tank at Tier 10. But even with that difference, its overall win ratio is still better than all but one of the tech tree mediums. The Lion is a favorite amongst very sweaty players who want to just deal good amounts of damage. This tank's strong. It's got a good mantle at 420 alpha and four shells and incredible damage per minute. It's a very fun tank to play on the battlefield. And I'm going to be putting it in the great performer section because of that. Next up, let's talk about the SDB-1. I'm putting this thing in the, the super competitive section. This was one of my favorite tanks to play in Onslaught, and it's still one of the most competitive tanks for the random queue. And that is because it's got god tier gun depression, a really good turret now, and 340 millimeters of heat pen, which puts its competition like the UDES to shame. This thing can rip apart anything on a ridge line, unlike other vehicles with their lesser pen, that rely on shooting at softer targets before they can really start to take advantage. The SDB-1 is strong for all players, but you are going to have to know what ridge lines to work to really make the SDB-1 work. So if you have poor map knowledge, this might not be the medium for you. Nevertheless, the SDB-1 is still one of the best picks you can make for tier 10 mediums. Next up, CS-63. This thing is going straight to the top of the list. It has by far the best win ratio, and uh, it's still having a very good impact on its players results as well i recently three marked the cs63 it's the hardest uh tier 10 medium tank to three mark so i was really happy about that uh and i had a whale of a time with it it's just this wonderful vehicle that can always 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 contest the early position there's no other vehicle that will get there before you will that is more dangerous than you are apart from maybe something like a 260 or an IS-7. But you will be there significantly earlier before their multiple seconds, which will allow you to hopefully set up the ambush against them or choose to leave the scenario. And that's why the CS-63 is so competitive. Speed in World of Tanks, combined with a rel relative amount of armor that does occasionally get you out of harm's way, just makes this CS-63 the dominator of the battlefield. If you know the maps and you know the most competitive locations and you're not afraid to go and take them from your opponents, then you will be very successful in the CS-63. Next up, the UDES. This vehicle is, is close between the godlike and the super competitive section. 
I would say for the majority of scenarios, it's actually better than the STB-1. And so I'm going to put it in the godlike section along with the CS-63 as well. It's this combination of 440 alpha damage and uh, incredible turret armor on this vehicle, as well as amazing camouflage that just makes an absolute powerhouse of the battlefield. However, let me clarify, with the UDES, the problem is the uh, the atrocious penetration on the gold rounds, which probably mean that it will actually be worse in a highly competitive environment like Onslaught than the SDB-1. So it's a bit of a weird scenario there. there. UDES, because of its camo, better for the random queue. SDB-1, because of its gold, uh, probably better for Onslaught. Still, you can't go wrong with either of those two vehicles, and I would recommend them for all of the player base. Next up, the Concept 5. I'm putting it in the I Hate It section. This is by far the most disappointing tank in the game for me right now. This tank is lowering its player's win ratio by on average by just under 4% in the last 30 days, more so than any other tier 10 medium. And now a lot of the hardcore players are starting to realize just how pathetic this tank is, that they aren't even playing it, and so its win ratio is plummeting as well. It truly is an, an atrocious tank for so many reasons. One of your wheels gets hit, they automatically slows down the vehicle by 65% or so. And it's every time your wheel gets hit, unlike a tracked vehicle, which it doesn't get tracked unless they hit the front axle. Combine this with tier nine damage per minute, awful camo rating and mediocre armor at best, apart from some parts of the turret. This thing is one of the worst tier tens that Wargaming have ever released. They had so much opportunity. It's a British wheeled medium, for goodness sake. An opportunity to do anything with the vehicle, and yet they failed every opportunity to make this a competitive tank, or even just a fun tank to play. Do not get yourself the concept until Wargiving do something about it. You'd do far better to get yourself a Centurion Action 10, which is going straight into the super competitive section for me. This vehicle, a lot like the STB-1 and the UDES, although I don't think it's quite as good as those two vehicles, just gets it done. Wargaming's mega buff of this vehicle now mean that it has great high explosive, good APCR, and incredible heat, 10 degrees of gun depression, and as long as you are using your gun depression, the turret is decent, and this gun handling is something else. Combine that with the fact that the vehicle's hull is well angled outwards, I mean to say in a, in a flared form you see up here, that means that you can over-angle the Centurion Action 10 and bait people into shooting your side armor and get away with absolute murder on this tank. This is a solid tank for everyone, and it's one of my most recommended choices for anyone who's looking for such an easy and dependable vehicle to play. So for all of you casual players out there who want to play something competitive, but you don't know the maps well enough to play the CS-63, and you don't know uh, the ridge lines well enough to play the UDES or the SDB-1, and you think the hydropneumatic suspensions will be confusing, get yourself the Centurion Action 10 instead. This is a very good tank. Now let's talk about the M60. Now, if I look at from a results perspective, it's probably all right situational. However, for me, I actually really enjoy this tank. I would love to put it in the great performer because it just I just go forwards with this tank and just get a ridge line and I don't worry about my camera rating and I've got enough firepower to be able to blaze through my opponents with 350 heat pen. So I think it's going to have to average out and put it in the decent choices section. Look, I don't think it's quite as good as the 121B, and so if you must spend your bonds because you can't sit on any kind of currency in World of Tanks, probably get yourself the 121B instead. However, I think the M60 is the more fun tank. I'd rather play... I can't believe I'm saying this, I'd rather play an M60 than play the M48A5 pattern these days, even though the M48A5 pattern is my most played tank, and I'd probably rather play the 121 than the 121B in that regard. So, the M60, I still don't think it's worth the amount of bonds that Wargaming want for it, but it is still uh, a decent fun tank to play. And I just realized I talked about the M60 while holding the M48A5 pattern uh, icon. Whoops. Well, you know what I think about the M4885 pattern, my most played tank, but I still think I'm going to have to put it... It's between the all right situational decent choices section. Oh, it's really tough because at what point does a medium tank stop being a medium tank and it's more of a heavy tank within that regard? I'm going to put it in the decent choices section. Actually, you know what? I'm going to put it in the all right situational section. Because I just think there are better medium tanks that you can be able to get your hands on these days. I think you'd be crazy to want to play this instead of playing the Centurion Action 10. 
Uh, and it, even with the buffs that this tank had several years ago, I just think there are better tanks that you could spend your hard-earned credits on. Next up, T22 Medium. This thing is still an absolute beast. I'm going to put it in the super competitive section. If you can manage to get your hands on this tank, if you're a very good player, you will be able to make very good use of this vehicle's angled side armor. However, let me clarify, if you're a casual player, this is probably dropping down a couple of notches to the decent choices section. And that's because you have to have extensive knowledge of angling with this vehicle, even quite advanced techniques like reverse side scraping out and baiting your opponents. But you also have to know what kind of ammunition they're using, what caliber of gun they have to be able to truly make use of the vehicle since it's buff it's back in the game and while you don't really see too many of them out on the battlefield in fact you see very few of them out on the battlefield it's still one of the best tanks for surprising casual players especially around this time of year next up k91 i'm putting this thing in the decent choices section it's a lot like a leopard within that regard a very very good sniper and trust me if you set this thing up correctly and you get yourself 40% camo while moving on this vehicle, you will be very surprised at how you will always outspot your opponents. And with this gun, which is probably the best gun on any tier 10 medium, you will definitely be out sniping them. This tank is also great for anyone out there who wants to auto aim at their opponents because it has 1,700 meters a second shell velocity on its standard rounds and very good pen. Uh, so if you absolutely utterly have to auto aim and you only auto aim in World of Tanks, which I wouldn't recommend doing, but if, for example, you have some, some hand issues, then the K91 might be a fantastic tank for you within that regard. Next up, Object 430U. I'm putting, putting this thing in the super competitive section because that's just what it is. This is one of the best tanks that you can play if you are a casual player in World of Tanks. This vehicle is buffing its player's win ratio by more than any other tier 10 tank in the game. Well, let me clarify medium tech tree tank in the game and that's just because 440 alpha great heat pen and reliable armor that is very forgiving means that casual players do well in this vehicle and great players will use all of those attributes to just dominate its opponents next up t62a i'm going to put this thing again in the avoid section because i don't feel passionate enough to say that i should i, I hate this tank it's an absolute tragic medium with the worst win ratio of any of the tier 10 medium tanks uh do not spend your credits on this vehicle get the 430u instead get the object 140 instead there is absolutely no point in playing a t62a unless wargaming buff it you'd do far better to get the great performing object 140 this thing with its seven degrees of gun depression and great gun will be super friendly for all manner of players and the above average players might actually do better in the 140 than they do in the 430u but it's still going to be going in the great performing section for me because I still think the 430U is, is better across the, the entire player base. Nevertheless, the 140, you just absolutely, utterly can't go wrong with this vehicle. And I would thoroughly recommend picking up the, the 140 if you're just looking for something well-rounded. I guess the problem the, the 140 has is that there are just so many other tanks that do things more special. And that makes the 140 quite forgettable. But if you're looking for a well-rounded Soviet tank, you can't go wrong with the 140. All right, so now we're going to be looking at the light tanks. And firstly, it's the WZ-1321. This vehicle is just a decent choice in every regard. It's got some armor, it's got some firepower, and it can still scout. But there are just better tanks to be able to play. Accordingly, I, I wouldn't recommend anyone get the WZ-1321, but I can't pretend that it's not at least still a decent choice for somebody who just wants a little bit of turret armor and to play something a little different that isn't so meta. Next up, let's talk about the EBR-105. Now, the EBR-105 is a bit of a weird one because it always meets an EBR-105 on the other team. So that means that it should be kind of perfectly balanced within that regard, right? Unless it can have enough of an impact in the battle that it can outplay the enemy EBR and then sway it into their favor for me since the nerfs of the ebr it's yo-yoing between the super competitive and great performing section i'm i'm probably going to put it in the great performer for casual players but for super competitive for your all the hardcore players out there you must 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 have bond vents and bond coated optics on this tank otherwise you just won't get enough view range combine that with a premium consumable and i have very quickly found that this tank playing free to play it's just not the same at all this is a tank that you must pay to win and i would recommend a directive i would recommend that premium consumable bond equipment minimum because you have to be able to pump up all of its statistics to a point where it can actually spot its opponents at decent distances and once you do that this, this is the fastest tank in the game and 
boy, can it make use of that attribute. Next up, let's talk about the 13105. I like this tank a lot. Three marked this vehicle this year, and I did it because I just hated the bat chat so much. I'm going to put it in the great performer section. However, if you're somebody who knows how to use an autoloader, it's going up probably more towards the super competitive section. This is the most dangerous light tank in the game, and it's doing more damage than any other light tank does in World of Tanks. Problem is, is that it's not doing that much more damage than all of the other light tanks do. And the other light tanks are scouting better than the 13105 does, which means that it can't go higher up this list. Next up, RHM. This vehicle was massively buffed this year, and while it's breathed uh, a new lease of life into this tank so that I won't put it in the avoid it or I hate it section, it's probably going to be an alright situational. It's still just not got enough armor and not enough camo, and in a meta where your light tanks need to be hyper scouts to compete with kind of like the Manticore and the T100LT, the Rheinmetall just doesn't really get the job done. It's still not in the atrocious state that it was previously. And if you're looking to do some damage without wanting to play the 13105 and play an autoloader, yeah, the RHM's not a bad pick. Next up, the Manticore. Okay, this thing's going straight up into godlike section. It is the best light tank in the game for pure scouting purposes. Incredible camo, incredible view range. There's no other tank that will be able to spot you before you spot them if you're playing correctly in the Manticore. And because of that, you can always get the drop on your opponents. If you get the drop on your opponents, then you'll have all the information available to make the best decision possible. And if you do that, how can you lose? So this is the tier 10 light tank that should have a spot in everybody's garages. Next up, let's talk about the Sheridan. It's kind of dropping in the all right situational section along with the RHM. Now, let me tell you, I think the Sheridan's win ratio is actually dragged down quite a lot by players who don't set this tank up correctly. Now, look, I know this is boring, but if you use the 105 millimeter on the Sheridan, it's actually a pretty voracious damage dealing light tank. A lot like the RHM, it's a great option for those of you that don't want to play the auto loading 13105. However, what I will say with the Sheridan is that the 152 millimeter is more fun, but why don't you go and play the T49 with the 152 millimeter instead? You'll be a whole tier lower. There'll be so many more juicy, weak armored tanks for you to be able to uh, penetrate with the same penetration that you would have with the 152 millimeter on the Sheridan. I three marked the T49 this year with that 152 millimeter derp gun, and I had a lot of fun with it. And I, I will play that thing only with the derp, but that frees up the Sheridan to always use the 105, at least for me. Next up, T100LT. Easy, super competitive tank here. It's not godlike like the Manticore, but it does have better damage per minute than the Manticore. So it's the better aggressive tank, but the Manticore is the better scout tank. So it comes down to what kind of a map you're on. If you're on like a Prokhorovka or a Malinovka, you're really going to struggle in a T100LT when you get matched up against a Manticore. But if you end up on like your Runeberg or your Himmelsdorf, then the, the T100LT is probably going to shred the Manticore and be able to be more impactful in that regard. The T100LT is the light tank that I would recommend for all of the average and below average players who want to get into playing light tanks. The tech tree is very friendly to be able to make your way up. And for all of the above average players, I'd recommend going for the Manticore instead. All right, so now we're going to be moving on to all the tank destroyers. First up, the 113 GFT. This vehicle has been substantially buffed. And because of that, I'm putting it in the great performer section. This vehicle has all of the firepower now, and it's just as fast as the Object 268 version 4 as that vehicle has been substantially nerfed. This 113 is sleeper OP. Not a lot of people think about it. If you hide the vehicle's lower plate and you watch out for the cheeks that it have, that you don't overturn the cheeks and then make them very flat for your opponents to be able to shoot, then the 113 is an absolute beast with a full-blooded tier 10 gun, 750 alpha on the AP and the heat with 395 millimeters of heat pen and 1100 HE if you're able to make use of it. This thing can really surprise its opponents. Next up, the 114 SP2. Now, you'll be able to get your hands on this vehicle if you missed it, if you're willing to get gold in Onslaught, but I think it's going to cost you 20,000 bonds to be able to pick it up. The 114 is going into the same section as the uh, the 113. It's a great performer. It's not great inside the game. Not well, It is great, but it's not like incredible inside the game because of its lack of armor. However, Still, uh, good players will do very well with this vehicle, and that's really the only kind of players who are probably going to get this tank because you have to play Onslaught and get gold to be able to get it if you didn't get it from ranked. I do think that the 114 has an advantage 
the only good players do have access to this and the fact that it hasn't been sold for a very long time means that the statistics are probably a lot better than they're going to be when this vehicle is released in the onslaught store so if any of you are looking to get your marks of excellence or like me finally get an ace tanker in this vehicle wait for the onslaught store to come out and i'm sure it'll be a hell of a lot easier as soon as that happens next up it's a tale of two foshes firstly the fosh b so this thing is yo-yoing between the decent choice and all right situational section i'd say it's probably more decent choices Look, how can you go wrong with 2,400 damage that you can deal in 10 seconds of the first shot? You can literally clip out an entire tank. The frustrating thing about the vehicle is trying to find a tank that has enough hit points that you can isolate to be able to uh, take it down. And inevitably that you're going to be losing a lot of hit points while you do that. Now, the key to being successful in the Fosh is finding just one tank and not two. Because as soon as you find two, they're going to be shooting the weak points on top of your tank and you won't have any hit points left later on to be able to make better trades. Nevertheless, the Fosh B is still the better of the two Foshes, but it's weird because it is the most dangerous tank in World of Tanks, but it still doesn't feel like it's all that worth playing uh, a lot of. Next up, Fosh 155. This one, it's kind of all right, situational slash avoid. I'm going to probably put it in the avoid section because I don't want all of you to waste your bonds. Trust me, go get the Tech Tree tank, get the Fosh B. You'll have far better games in the Fosh B than you will have in the Fosh 155. However, saying that, the kind of ammunition that you get on the Fosh 155 is kind of hilarious. 750 alpha damage delivered three times is not as good as delivering 400 alpha six times. And uh, it will take exactly the same amount of time for both TDs to unload. However, the Fosh 155 has better heat rounds at 395 which can just laugh its way through certain plates. And this thing has a meme mag of 1,100 alpha HE, which it can deliver three times, which would be 3,300 if you can find healthy enough lightly armored tanks to be able to obliterate. Still wouldn't recommend spending your bonds on it. There are better picks inside the game. Now I want to talk about the Gorilla. This is going in the all right situational section for me. If we think about it from a competitive stance, but I think it will go up into like great performer or above if we're just thinking about fun inside the game. And quite often that's what it's about. This vehicle does best with experimental turbo, something like exhaust and either a gun rammer or coated optics. And then set yourself up as the most accurate tank in the game by take, uh, taking the penultimate field mod by improving your accuracy as 5%. Then you're going to have this pinpoint laser finder of a gun with 750 alpha damage that you can deliver reliably irrelevant of the distance that you're engaging your opponent the problem is is that its camera rating is poor its mantlet or shall i say its gun shield is penetratable by high explosive rounds and it's just such an easy big juicy target that a lot of people will focus on the battlefield the gorilla has definitely seen better days in world of tanks next i want to talk about the yag panzer e100 this thing is it's jumping between super competitive and great performer for me. I think I'll leave it in the, the, the great performer section. This vehicle has the highest penetration of any tank inside the game at 420, and it's still so fun to be able to play with. I love playing this tank. It's just, it, there's something magical about just obliterating whatever's in front of it. And I think having Max von Krieger on this vehicle makes it even more fun with the voice acting as well. I think he's probably my favorite commander to be able to have in this vehicle. And they definitely make a great pairing. I honestly think that the, the German tank destroyers are a super fun line to be able to play up. And they're great for any player, not just the most competitive ones. And interestingly enough, even though the best players aren't playing the Jagdpanzer E100, it's still giving its players some of the best win ratio results. So look no further than the Jagdpanzer E100 if you're looking for a fun tank destroyer to play that is still pretty good. Next up, let's talk about the WTE100. This thing came out uh, again as a rental and... Um, I'd say if it was to released in the game in the, in the form that it was, I'd probably put it in the avoid section. It's not a very competitive tank. The game has evolved so much more. Everyone has intuition. Everybody could quickly reload a high explosive round to be able to put through your turret. And just having that stopping power, which was incredibly toxic to go back into the game, just doesn't really feel like it's the true threat that it used to be inside World of Tanks. If this vehicle was released again, and it was in the form that we saw it, for the uh, the game mode, I'd recommend to avoid it, boys and girls. And I think that I, I've got a funny feeling that we might see it come in some shape or form this year in some kind of loot box. But we'll have to see. We'll have to see what Wargaming have planned. Next up, the Minotauro. This vehicle, godlike in every single regard. This thing is 
bonkers overpowered. It is the best tank destroyer in the game and I would thoroughly recommend it for everyone. The problem with the Minotaur is it might be a little bit boring to play, so people will find more interesting tank destroyers to be able to invest their time into. But if you don't care about that, and all you care about is getting solid results, it doesn't matter how good you are at the game. If you get the Minotaur, you should be doing better in this than you would do in any other tank destroyer. Next, let's talk about the STR V103B. This is a Swedish sniping powerhouse. If you're a good player for me, I want to put it up in like the great performers section. But I think this is a list for everyone and I'm going to put it in the decent choices section. It's a wonderful sniper, but it's quite high skill cap. Uh, or should I say it's got high potential, but a lot of it can be played quite well by just sitting in one position and just clicking and just using its amazing sniping capacity. But where an SDRV 103B player will be just the differences that we'll see between the good and the great and the incredible SDRV players are the players who are willing to take the fight to the enemy team and realize it's just a medium tank without a turret. If you have good knowledge of all of the enemy's gun calibers, you'll know which guns stand a chance of being able to deal with you and which guns don't stand a chance of being able to deal with you. And once you've mastered that, you'll be able to take your STRV on the hunt and, and to uh, really take the fight to the enemy team. And when you do that, you'll actually get some incredible results in this vehicle. And I would personally recommend it as one of the more fun tank destroyers to play in the game. Next up, the FV215B183. Now, while this is the better of the big gun tank destroyers, I'm still going to put it in the all right situational section because the times that you do get people just drive out in front of you constantly and allow you to just dump big shells in feels like it's more down to the enemies playing badly than you playing well. For me, it's one of the most frustrating tanks to play in the game because of that. And while it is better than its brother, the FV405, I'm not sure that's really saying much. And I'm just going to go out there and say I absolutely hate the FV4005 with a passion. I despise this tank and I wouldn't recommend anyone gets it inside World of Tanks. It's a really boring play style. And while it does have moments of fun, after you've one shot like 50 or 100 tanks, it just doesn't feel the same. And that all you're left with is an incredibly boring point and click adventure. I hate the FV4005 having to sit there, especially towards the end of the evening after I've been streaming for so long and just having to wait for somebody to drive out and then haha click boom or 1700 damage good. How, how long of your life did you have to invest into that? And some things are just not worth waiting for. And so I would not recommend getting the FV4005 as it's an expensive tank to play if you want to play it correctly and it just does me more harm than good. Next up, let's talk about the Badger. This one's going in great performer for me. If you can't play the Badger, you're probably doing it wrong. It's really simple. You just get forwards, get on a ridge line, and grind out whatever's in front of you. It's got the highest damage per minute in World of Tanks, and if you manage to make your high explosive rounds work, you are going to be shredding multiple tanks per minute. It's just a solid tank. I guess the problem with the Badger is it doesn't really have incredible alpha, it doesn't have incredible pen, and it can still be locked down if you do expose your tracks and you do get surrounded. There are ways around this, like using a durability device, for example, or thinking about how you're going to set up your field mods with a large repair kit can mitigate this weakness. And it's just a very strong tank for me personally. I don't think you could go wrong with the Badger. Next up, let's talk about the T110E4. This tank for me is yo-yoing between all right situational and decent choices. It's probably got to go into decent choices. Look, I think there are better tank destroyers that you could be able to play and the idea of picking a T110E4 when you could pick a Minotauro is literal madness. But I still have to respect any tank that has 750 alpha access to 375 millimeters of gold pen, unlike the Minotauro, and access to those wonderful high explosive rounds as well. Like its brother, the T110E3. T1 3 for me is still super competitive, even with the nerfs. It's getting both one of the best win ratios with win ratio different and also just with raw win ratio. And it does that because it's just so darn hard to be able to deal with this tank. You, It's really hard to pen the lower plate even with tier 10 tanks, let alone with tier 8 and tier 9 tanks. It just deals consistent damage. It holds up the battle and it allows uh, its allies to work around it or to win the other flank. It's a very strong tank within that regard and it's incredibly annoying to play against as well. So go on, get yourself a T1 3 and annoy big sweaty unicorns like me, irrelevant of where you go on the map. Next, let's talk about the Ultra Rare Object 268 version 5. It's all right situational. There's nothing special about this tank. This vehicle has a fully traversable turret 
and we're getting more and more tanks that have turrets in World of Tanks on tank destroyers. And while it does have a really big gun, like that meaty full-blooded 268 gun, I just don't think the turret's worth it to have that weak point and to have the poor damage per minute and the poor hull armor and poor gun depression that this vehicle has. There are better tanks that you can be able to get, but this one undoubtedly is a collector's gem and it's very rare. Next up, the 268 version 4, and this vehicle last year, I believe, was up in the godlike section. However, now it's going to have dropped into the great performer section. The nerfs have hit this tank really hard, losing 10 kilometers an hour off this vehicle, as well as the durability. And also the weak point on top is now much easier to be able to deal with. Means that this is still a great choice, but it's almost depressing to play this vehicle considering how much worse it is than it previously was. And now, look, don't get me wrong, I think that the nerf was great for this vehicle. Well, it obviously wasn't great for the vehicle, but it was great for the balance of the game. But I think what this really has done is it now means that other tanks like the Minotauro or the T-123 are just going to be a better choice for you. Next up, the Object 268. This one's going in decent choices for me. A, a lot of, this is a very underrated tank. Let me tell you, if you play this thing well, it will be very strong on the battlefield. Big gun nice assault capacity and now that the 268 version 4 has been nerfed there is more opportunity for this vehicle however i still think that you would do better with a 113 on this vehicle or alternatively with a hori 3 than you would do with this tank so the 268 it's still a good choice but i would probably recommend getting the hori 3 or alternatively the 113 instead and talk about the hori 3 i seem to have forgot where i'm gonna uh to the icon so you're just gonna have to imagine Boop, I've put the Hori 3 there. I can't make this any smaller, but oh God. There you go, right there on the uh, the super competitive section. It's a little bit bigger than all of the others. Uh, the Hori 3 is a phenomenal tank and it's about as close to godlike as it could be. The problem that the Hori 3 has is that it's played by very sweaty players and other tanks are actually giving their owners better results respective of their win ratios. And so, while the Hori 3 is absolutely smashing its games, it does not deserve to be in the same tier as the Minotauro. Nevertheless, this doesn't mean that this is not a competitive tank. That's the reason why it's going in the super competitive section. And it is a, a great choice for anyone to be able to achieve, especially considering how nice a lot of the uh, Japanese tank destroyer tech tree is to play up inside World of Tanks. All right, so now, oh God, I'm going to be rating artillery. So what? This is going to be, I hate it, I hate it, I hate it, I hate it, and I hate it, is it? Okay, look, 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 I'll do this seriously then. Okay, so Batch at 15558. Yeah, I think this one's pretty good. I think it's probably got to go into the decent choices section. Uh, it's, it's I'd say the, the better of the, the artillery if you manage to get onto an open map. And the problem is, is this, this tank, it's got a very flat shell trajectory. And so you can't really hit things that are behind cover or behind buildings. It's also very fast, so it can relocate, so it has more opportunity to be able to catch its opponents that way. The problem with the Bat Chat is unless it's shooting very weakly armored tanks or it's doing what it's really meant to do, which is to stun its opponents while its allies finish them off, then it can really suffer against the super heavy vehicles. Next up, the GWE 100. Yeah, all right, situational. This is just an all-round self-propelled gun. Since the artillery nerfs, I'd say it's just right in the middle of the pack really i think that this one actually benefited more from the self-propelled gun nerfs than a lot of the tanks did that still doesn't mean that it's going to be a great vehicle to play next up the uh the uh, the conqueror gun carrier this one is going in the i hate it section this vehicle i think is the least competitive of the artillery and while it does have an amazing shell trajectory and a big splash getting your opponents to sit still for it can be a very tough thing to uh to ask them to do now on to the the t92 this one's going in the avoid section for me uh i don't think it's as frustrating as the conqueror gun carriage because it does have a better shell trajectory as in it's flatter but that can be very frustrating if your opponent aren't sitting for you right in the open and not behind cover so the conqueror gun carriage will be better for shooting tanks that are hiding behind a ridge line or a mountain or something whereas the t92 will be better at just dumping in big damage at tanks that are out in the open but I think the real problem with the, the T92 is the Object 261. This vehicle is a decent choice. Uh, if not, it's a great performer. And that's because this thing just smashes damage at whatever is out in the open. But again, it has that problem with the flat shell trajectory. And so it can't catch things on certain city maps unless you know your positions. But I'd say all in all, the Object 261 is the best tier 10 self-propelled gun. But I'm 
just going to deviate and talk about something else here. A lot of people will only play artillery for missions. You don't really need to go above tier 9. The tier 10s are fairly unnecessary for most, if not all, of the missions. And the real self-propelled gun you want to get for doing all of your artillery missions is the M5355. It's all you need inside the game. Get the M5355. Get your missions done. Don't bother with any of the tier 10 self-propelled guns. They just don't feel like they're worth it. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, that was my tier 10 tier list with tanks that I recommend you try and focus on this year and vehicles that I thoroughly recommend you don't. I really hope this video was useful for you today and it saved you a lot of time, credits, gold, money, free experience or just disappointment which is something that it's hard to be able to uh, quantify. Anyway, congratulations to all of you if you managed to make it through this mammoth video. I'd love to hear in the comments down below if you agree or disagree with any of my specific placements. And if you appreciate this video and you think it's going to save you a lot of time, then make sure you give the video a thumbs up. But if you hated it, give it a thumbs down. And as always, thank you so much for watching. You've been epic and hopefully I'll see you soon.